Well, <laughs> all right, fantastic. Well, hey, let me just uh, introduce myself quick before we dive into uh, the Word of God this morning. My name is Jared, and alongside my wife, Beth, we are the location pastors here at the city location at Base Church. And it's an honor to be a part of this community. We have been involved in our morning services as a church uh, since, like, they started back in the day when we were used to be Slade and it used to kind of meet in Maxwell's in the morning. And it's been so cool to see all that God is doing in these services. And so it's a real honor to be a part of BASE and to be a part of this community. And, um, and Beth is real uh, sad not to be here today. She said, she said, you need to tell people that I'm not sick because I don't want everybody to think that I'm sick. And I was like, why does it matter if they think that you're sick or not? So just tell them I'm not sick. But we had um, our van, uh, the engine in our van, just something bad is happening to it right now. And so it's in getting fixed, and it has all of our car seats and the ability to transport our three children to church. And so she's home tuning in online with the kids this morning. But I just, she really wanted me to tell you that she's not sick. So... Don't text her about being sick. <laughs> but, uh, but man, it's a, it's a real honor to be here this morning. I'm excited. We're in this uh, series called Life Depends On It. And what we're talking about over the four weeks in this series is what does it look like for us as followers of Jesus to go and to tell people in our lives about the love that God has for them and invite them into this community that is the church. This community that is a group of people that are following after Jesus, trying to figure out what it means to allow them to change and transform our lives over the course of our lives and use that as a testimony of his goodness to the world around us. And so we've been talking a little bit about um, the way that, that God has transformed our lives as individuals. And we've been talking about loving God and not losing that love for God as we grow in our faith and as we go in our relationship with Jesus. What does it look like to be in awe and inspired of the goodness and the faithfulness of God and his love towards us? And today we're going to talk about um, this idea that as much as we often think about our faith and our relationship with God as an individual and on an individual basis, God is actually using the collective church, the body of believers, not just the global church, but this community. Like if you look around to your left and your right, all of the people that are in this room, God is using us and the way that we love one another, the way that we treat one another, the way that we care for one another as a way, as a demonstration, as a light post to the world around us of what he actually desires our lives to look like. And it's a demonstration of his love for us. Jesus says to his disciples, they'll, they'll know you're my disciples. The world will know that you're my followers by the way that you love one another. And when I do that, I'm not setting up. If you're in the room and you're like, you didn't know that verse or that passage, that's totally okay. I was just more for those of us that have grown up in church going, hey, I actually know this stuff. And I want to draw it out of us this morning, what the Bible says about following Jesus, being an example to the world around us. All right. So if you open up your Bible to the book of Acts chapter 2. Verse 42, how many people brought a physical Bible here this morning? I keep asking this because I just want to know. It's growing every week, everybody. was more and more of us. Acts 2, verse 42. We're going to read down to 47. If you don't have it, that's all right. Uh, we've got Bibles on our phones, and you can pull that up on your phone. Uh, if you don't have it on your phone or you don't have your phone with you, you can take a look at the screen behind me. It'll be there. Um, but I'm excited to read this because this passage of Scripture that we're going to read this morning, it's one of like the first uh, times that we see the church begin to, to grow and expand. And so oftentimes, like, we, we think about, like, the modern church today, what we have right now. How did we get where we are? How are we all sitting in this room opening the Bible? Why do we know what to do? Is worship really the right thing to do? Is teaching from Scripture really the right thing to do? Is gathering together? Like, where do we get this from? Well, we get it from Scripture. We're trying to model our community after what we see in the Bible. We're not just making this stuff up and going, hey, let's see how many people we can squeeze into a room and sing some songs and read out of a book. We're trying to follow this, this model that the early church sets for us. And so what we have, so that you guys know where we're picking up the story this morning, is Jesus has been with his disciples for the last three-ish years. He's been teaching about uh, what the kingdom of God looks like. Jesus' main message when he's here, he, he, he preaches this message of repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Jesus is saying, turn from your ways in your life, the things that you think are right, the things that you think are true, the things that, that you think are actually the, the, the reality that you're building your life on. Turn away from that because the kingdom of heaven, the kingdom of God, is at hand. It's Jesus' primary message. And then he leaves his disciples, goes back up into heaven, and the disciples are like, okay, what, what do we do with this now? Well, Jesus hasn't left them without instructions. He's given this command to go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. He's commissioned his disciples in what we call the Great Commission 
to go and to actually tell the world about his love for them, to tell the world about his goodness, to tell the world that God came down, became a human being, and gave his life for people because he loves them and he desires a relationship with them. This is the gospel message of Jesus that the disciples are left to go and tell everybody. But Jesus says, before you go out and do that, before you just start trying, like what a big goal in front of the, the disciples. It's like a really interesting leadership model that Jesus gives this crazy goal to these 12 people. And he's like, okay, now go and do this. But before you do it, Jesus says, wait here, wait for my spirit. I'm going to send a helper. I'm going to send my spirit to empower you, to give you what you need to go and share this good news across all the nations. God, Jesus says, just hold on. And when he comes on you, then you're going to go out and you're going to share this goodness out of the power of the Holy Spirit, not out of your own power and ability. So that's what, that's what we see. And so, so the disciples, they wait. They're hanging on. And then the Spirit of God comes and, and he actually meets the disciples there and he fills them with the Spirit. And they begin to sing and they begin to praise God and they're speaking in, in tongues. And, and there's so many people that are gathered around these 120 people that are, that are there. And they start to hear their own language. And they're like, who are these guys that they're speaking in our language? There's so many different languages that they're speaking. This is crazy. And, and the people start to kind of guess at why they're able to do this. Why can they do this? And and somebody throws in, oh, they're probably, you know, they're probably drunk. And they make a joke about it. And Peter, he gets bothered by this. And he goes, no, 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 no. Listen, this is not why we're able to do this suddenly. And he stands up and he gives this address to all of these people that are, that are watching. And it's a really interesting time because so many people in the surrounding regions had gathered together in Jerusalem uh, in order for, uh, to be together for Passover. So there's all these people that don't actually live there but are gathered there. And Peter goes, okay, I'm going to actually like respond here for a second. So Peter gets up and he starts to preach about who the Messiah is. He gets up and he says, this is who Jesus is. This is the one that we've been waiting for. The Messiah, God has come and he's reconciled us into relationship with him. And he shares this out. And in this address that Peter gives to the people that are uh, watching, 3,000 people are moved by Peter's words and moved by the spirit of God. And they go, wow, there's something to this. This is real. This is true. How do I... How, what do I do with this information? And so all these people that are gathered from different areas, some are local to the region, some have come from different places, they're hearing this message of Jesus. And they're going, i got to do something about this. And so they shift their life, they change their life. It says 3,000 are added to their number that day. Crazy. They go from 120 to 3,000. It's like a real logistics problem in front of Peter and the disciples. Can you imagine if, like, there's probably about 120 in this room this morning. If we were here and the Holy Spirit fell on us today and we went out and we shared this good news and 3,000 people showed up tomorrow or next Sunday, what would we do with that? I mean, that's the prayer. This is where we're picking up the scripture today. Those 3,000 people now join what is the early church. And they're going, okay, now what do we do? Well, how do we live this out? What, what's the next step? I, I want to follow Jesus. I want this to change my life. So Acts 2, verse 42, says this. Now, I want to I preface this really quickly before we, before we read it. Because sometimes people will look at the church in Acts 2 and go, like, this is what the church should look like. All the time, this is what the church should look like globally, all the time, everywhere. This is the model of the church most clearly given to us in Scripture. And there are elements that are true to that. I would say for the bulk of it, for the heart posture, for the attitude, that is true. But we also don't want to just look at the method of the early church and go, I'm going to map that on to my life here in this modern era because times have changed, life has changed. And so what we're pulling out of this is the heart posture of the people and what God did with their hearts, not necessarily what they did. Does that make sense? Doesn't mean what they did is bad or it's not applicable to our lives. I just don't want us reading this and going like, all right, suddenly I got to do all of this stuff to a T that they're sharing. But we're going to unpack that. Acts 2, verse 42, says this. They devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to fellowship, to the breaking of bread and to prayer. Everyone was filled with awe at the many signs and wonders performed by the apostles. All the believers were together, and they had everything in common. They sold property and possessions to give to anybody that had need. Every day they continued to meet together in the temple courts. They broke bread in their homes, and they ate together with glad and sincere hearts, praising God and enjoying the favor of all people. And the Lord added to their number daily those who were being saved. This passage of scripture is a beautiful thing. This is the beginning 
of the church that we see all across the world today, of the church that we're a part of. This is the start of that, where God has gathered these people, he's given them the spirit, and he's demonstrating through the love that he has for them what it means to be a part of this community. I'll give you the main point of this passage that we're going to we're unpack, and I'll give you all my points this morning because I really only have two. The main point of this passage is the Holy Spirit at work in devoted believers is a witness to the world of the goodness of God and his love for them. I'm going to say that again. If you're taking notes, you can write this down because it took me a long time to synthesize this passage into one line here. It took me like 20 minutes, which I think for some people it would take like just an instant, but my brain's all over the place. It says this. The main point of this passage, the Holy Spirit at work in devoted believers is a witness to the world of the goodness of God and his love for them. There's two points to the message today that we're going to unpack together. There's a lot of practicals that I want to throw our way because you go, okay, what does it mean to, to live this out today? That's awesome that every day they're in the temple courts together, but like how do I, how do I apply that to my life? Two main points for today's message is the early church was devoted. The early church was devoted. Second point, people noted. That rhymes. And Jesus is goaded is the third point. <laughs> Just kidding. We'll get there though. The early church was devoted. The early church was devoted to the teachings of Jesus. They were devoted to this, uh, the teachings of the apostles. They were devoted to fellowship. They were devoted to breaking bread. They were devoted to prayer. And the whole idea behind this is like, Outside looking in, the lives of the early church were, were a draw to the people around them. The Bible says they were added to their numbers daily. So something that was happening in this community mattered to the people around them. It affected them. It changed their life. And oftentimes we can go like, how is the church like a witness to the world? What does that actually mean for the church to be a witness to the world of God's love for them? Well, it's not an unfamiliar concept. If we think about like just a different context for a second here, there's lots of things in the world, lots of communities, lots of groups that witness to the goodness of the thing that they do, right? The, the first group, as I was thinking about this, like what are other communities that do this? The first group that I thought of uh, was cyclists, all right? So if you're a cyclist, if you've got a road bike or a gravel bike or a mountain bike or any kind of bike that people are talking about, if you talk to a cyclist, they will tell you about how great it is to be a cyclist. You've got to get on the road. It's so fun to bike. I got all my friends, and we all do it together on Saturday mornings. Runners are like this, too. Oh, join this run club. I'll tell you the coolest shoes to get. We got these really small shorts, and I got this backpack that has gel inside of it that I can eat when I run really, really far with all my friends. And, and, and it's, it's like, okay, this is cool, man. You're really passionate about it. But then you see it, and you see all these groups of people gathering together. And you kind of look on it from the outside, and you're like, wow, these people really care about this thing. The worst of the worst for this, the worst of the worst for this is CrossFitters. <laughs> the worst of the worst for this. CrossFitters, how do you know someone's a CrossFitter? They'll tell you. Come on, thank you, Adam. <laughs> They'll tell you. And here's the thing. CrossFitters, like, the more that I hear about CrossFit, I will say I've been evangelized about CrossFit more than I've been evangelized about Jesus in my entire life. That is for sure. So we can take some notes from the CrossFit community on how to do this. But the thing about CrossFit is, like, I'll look at bikers a cyclist, and I'm like, nah, that's all right. It's kind of cool. I don't, I don't see the draw there. I'll look at uh, run clubs and go, that's getting a little more my speed. Like, it's really low lift. I just got to show up, and, and I get to hang out with my friends and run. And I look at CrossFitters, man, it starts to scratch a little bit of an itch for me. And I'm like, they kind of have it all. They're getting together. They're hanging out. Every time I see po people posting about their CrossFit gym, it looks like they're having fun. They're giving each other high fives. They're lifting heavy weights. They're moving their bodies around. But the biggest selling point for me when it comes to CrossFit, the biggest selling point for me is the bodies of the people that do CrossFit. Every guy I know that does CrossFit, I look at them and go, man, I wish I looked like that guy. I know Mario does CrossFit. David does CrossFit. But at the top of this list... Anybody know where I'm going with this? It's Tanner Philp. And I'm sorry, Tanner, you're sitting in the front row, and I'm going to dog on you for a little bit here. I remember the first time that I worked out with Tanner, I just thought he was a normal guy. I went over to his house. He's got a whole CrossFit gym in his garage, and, and we started working out, and we got into the workout. And how about halfway through the workout, Tanner took his shirt off, and I remember just like, close your mouth, dude. Focus on your workout. Don't look over at him. Just don't, don't weird him out. You were just becoming friends. Like, don't be creepy. I remember thinking, holy smokes. Actually, Tanner, could you just come up here real quick and take your shirt? <laughs> I'm kidding, I'm kidding, I'm kidding. But I was like, man, this guy is crazy. And then I started to get to know Tanner a little bit more. And I realized Tanner does this every day. 
Tanner doesn't miss a day when he's not in the gym putting in work to do his best job of that. And then I learned more about him. He, he doesn't just do it every day, but he actually competes in this annually. And he, and he goes out for the competition. He never, like, records his time publicly because he's just like, I just do it for me. But he's dedicated to this thing. He's devoted to this thing. Now Tanner's devotion in this thing is pulling up some real results in his life. Like You pull that shirt off and it's like, I can see the work you're putting in. See, his dedication, it led to results, right? And I'm looking at the results, and I'm going, man, you don't look like everybody else, bro. Certainly don't look like me. And the selling point for me is like, I want to look like that. So how did you get like that? What did you have to do to, to get to that spot? I started to take notice. And then I realized there was a trend. I met a couple other CrossFitters. I was like, man, you all kind of look like this. What's going on here? And the more that I met CrossFit people, the more I was inspired by the lives that they lived, the way that they treated themselves, the way that they valued their bodies, the way that they put effort into this stuff. See, this idea of the church being a, a witness to the world is not a new thought. It happens all the time. And this is the same principle that applies to the church today. This idea that devotion leads to results. It leads to change and transformation. A devotion to truth, a devotion to Jesus, a devotion to a relationship with God, to understanding the teaching. Because, listen, devotion is not an easy thing. It takes consistency. It takes showing up. It takes faithfulness. I, uh, I looked at a couple different words for devoted. Ardent, dedicated, devout, faithful, loving, staunch, steadfast. Looking at all of these things. Devotion to something takes effort. But if you'll be devoted to that thing, day in, day out, again and again, you will start to see a change. You'll start to see results. You'll start to see transformation in whatever thing you're devoted to, whatever you're focused on. And as there's a, a change and as there's a transformation, what happens next? There's a real difference from those around you. I'm, I'm living a different life than the people that are around me. I look different. I talk different. I act different. I sound different. Not because I'm so special, but because I'm devoted to following Jesus. And when we look different and we act different and we talk different and we live a different life, people start to take notice. And this is what's outlined for us in Acts. This is how it works to be a community of believers that love God, are devoted to God, and love one another. It's a demonstration to the world around and go like, man, CrossFit is great, but whatever they're doing at Base Church, there's something, I want something like that. Because we all have six packs. No, I'm just kidding. It's not the reason. Because we're living transformed lives. I watched this Instagram uh, reel this past week of this guy. He's like, I'm a young guy, professional. I moved to Austin, Texas. I'm going to give you eight tips on how to build community. And he laid out all these things on how to build community. And I was like, bro, just go to church, man. <laughs> like, you don't have to work that hard. It's already here. And the thing about the community that we have, this guy's going like, this community sharpens me and it makes me a better thinker. It makes me a better worker and more productive in my life. And they hold me to higher standards. That's great. But at the end of our life, all that stuff just dissipates. It disappears. You don't bring your 401k into the grave with you. You don't bring your six-pack into the grave with you. You don't bring your dreams and aspirations and goals into the grave with you. At the end of our life, if we're not building our life on something that matters or is solid or is valuable or is true, what are we doing? This guy's putting all this work into building a community. I'm like, man, thank you, God, that we have the church. That's not just a beautiful community, but it's centered on truth, centered on reality. Now, the thing about communities, though, is they can say they do one thing, but if they're not devoted to that thing, they're not going to see the results of it in their life. I can say I do CrossFit, and I, I'm not devoted to CrossFit. I've done a couple CrossFit workouts. And if you were to have an interaction with me and see the way that I eat and see uh, the way that I take uh, two flights of stairs and see the way that I do all kinds of these different things, you're going to go, this guy is not a great witness to CrossFit community. <laughs> and the same is true for the church. If we're not devoted to the things of God, if we're not devoted to knowing him and, and, and learning about him and allowing the truth of the gospel to change and transform our lives, we're not going to see transformation. And we're not going to be a good witness to the world around us. The early church was devoted. Let's read that through again, just highlighting the things that we see that talk about devotion. They devoted themselves to what? The teachings of the apostles, to fellowship, gathering together, being around one another, 
to the breaking of bread. This is sharing meals. It could also be talking about communion and taking communion together. And to prayer. These people were devoted to prayer. Man, I read that one and I, I thought, I pray, but am I devoted to prayer? Am I devoted to praying for the people in my life? I get a lot of text messages in a week. Hey, man, really struggling with this. Wondering if you can pray for me. I never respond saying, sorry, bro, don't have time to pray for you. Hope you're doing well. I always respond, hey, man, I'm, I'm praying for you. Am I devoted to praying for that person? Am I actually praying for the people in my life? Or am I just kind of throwing out like a, an easy response to that? What I've been trying to do now is go, okay, if I send that text message, I'm going to take the next minute to two minutes to actively pray for that person. And God, would you keep reminding me of their needs so that I can continue to pray for it? But are we devoted to prayer? All the believers were together, and they had everything in common. They sold property and possessions to give to anybody that had need. Every day they continued to meet together in the temple courts. I'm reading this through, and I'm looking at it, and I'm going, man, this early church that's found Jesus for the first time, like, they've allowed this truth to permeate their whole life. There's nothing that they're holding back in these early days. They're going, God, change every part of me. They're given the two most important things that they have. What are the two most important things? If you want to know what you value, what you care about, like we can say we value a lot of stuff. I can say I, I value CrossFit. But if you actually look at my life, the two things that are real indicators of what we value is what? Just think for a second on it. Time and money. Where I put my time and where I put my dollars are, are a demonstration of the things that I value, the things that I care about. So I can say all day, oh, man, I love this church. I love the people that are here. I, I love being a part of it. But if my time and my money is not affected by the people that are around me, do I really love them? Do I really value them? Is this really that important to me? Look at this early on. They gave their time. It wasn't a part of their life that it didn't touch. It touched the time of the people. These 3,000 people are here for a different reason. They weren't here to join the early church. They just came into contact with God. And now they're like, okay, what do I do now? I, I'm going to start gathering. Every day I'm going to get together with these people. I'm going to be devoted to this. I'm going to let it change and transform me. I'm going I'm to focus on this stuff. Sometimes I look at my life and I go, man, how much of my day in and day out am I allowing God to transform? And how much of my walk in my faith with God is confined to Sunday mornings and Sunday afternoons? It's an important question to ask. Sunday, man, I am in the Lord's house. Praise God. I'm here, I'm two hands high, I'm front row, I'm jumping up and down. You want to two-step in that song, man? I'm two-stepping all over this place. God is good, I'm excited. Monday comes, I'm back on my grind. I'm focused, I'm climbing the corporate ladder, I'm doing my thing, I'm working on, my, on my, all my employees, I got a bunch of stuff going on, I'm really busy, I got a lot of work going on. Saturday comes, I'm tired from the week. I've been working Monday to Friday, I've been working real hard. Friday night, Saturday... That's me time, man. I just want to hang out, maybe hang out with my kids, maybe hang out with a friend of mine, play some golf, kind of do my thing. But, man, Sunday's coming, Sunday morning. Here we go, back in church, praising God, love them. I mean, I'm really grateful for the people that that's their experience of God. I'm not trying to dog on that because I live that out some weeks, more weeks than I would like to admit. Do I live my life confining my worship of God to a Sunday morning like this? I'm not speaking down to anybody. I'm talking to myself and anybody else that's been in that spot. But God doesn't just want our Sunday mornings. God wants our Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday. God wants all of our moments. He wants to walk with us in all of our moments. It's not just about, okay, it's not even a time thing too. You might be hearing this and going, bro, I don't have any more time. I understand. I got a, a three-year-old, a one-year-old, and a four-month-old. I know what it's like to not have time. There are some days I will crash in bed at 11 p.m. and be like, I didn't do a single thing for myself today. Everything I did today was for somebody else. God, what is going on in my life? It's busy. We live busy lives. And that's not always a bad thing. But this is why I say, look at the principle that's here. The principle is like, we can change the attention that we give to God. When I'm scrambling around making eggs for the kids in the morning, I don't have extra time to go, okay, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to sit aside. I was talking to um, Nick Ferguson about this, and he's like, bro, I'm waking up at 4.30 in the morning so that I can focus on uh, things for school. I don't know how to get up earlier than that to work on my relationship with God. And it's like, dude, that's like, it's a great point. There's only so many hours in the day. So it's about inviting God into everything that we're doing every day. As I'm making those eggs for the kids in the morning, I, and <laughs> Jude is grabbing my leg going, up, I want to see, up, up, up. 
I got to be going, God, how do you want me to parent these kids this morning? God, would you use me this morning to be a good representation of these kids and the love that you have for them? When I'm driving into the office, maybe you got a long commute, maybe you got a short commute, instead of putting on another podcast, another song, playing another episode of Smartless or whatever you listen to, as you're driving into work on a Monday morning, what if you allow God to speak to you in that time? And you say, God, how do you want to use me today? Who do you have for me today to tell them that you love them? God, who, who, who are you going to bring in my path and what do you want me to say to them this morning? God, what do I have in my hands today that you've given me that I can bless somebody with? Maybe that's a word of encouragement. Maybe that's just noticing somebody. Man, some people go through their whole lives just desiring somebody to look at them and notice them. Maybe God wants to use you in your workplace for that thing. Are we letting God take a hold of our everyday life? Has it permeated? Are we devoted? And here's, here's how it affects us corporately. Because right, we talked about the church being a witness. And I'm talking a lot about the individual here. But how it affects us corporately is the way that we actually see and love one another. Have we allowed what God is doing in our life? Have we allowed this gospel message? Have we devoted ourselves to a love and a knowledge of God that's beginning to change and transform us that affects the people that we bring around us in our life? Like oftentimes, I'll look at some of my closest relationships, and it's all people that have really strong relationships with God. I'm going, God, I know that there are other people in my life that you desire to, be, uh, to use me to be an example and to encourage and to love and to invite into what you've done in my life. This good thing, it's not just for me, but Lord, you want to bring other people into that. So like, show me who those people are. Open my eyes to it. Man, I, I envy a lot of the people that are, are working uh, like nine to fives in the corporate space or in trades or things like that. Basically that don't work at church. Because the beautiful thing about that is, is you have so many people that need to know this around you all the time. That's an amazing thing. And I'm very grateful for what God has invited me to do in my life. And I'm not dogging on that at all. But one of the challenges in that is I have to work really hard to find people that don't know God. Or else I'm just constantly around Christians. So I'm going, God, would you open my eyes to the people in my life that you love, that you want to use me to speak to? What a prayer for each one of us here in this space this morning. That guy with greasy hair at my kid's ballet class, would you use me to speak to that guy? First of all, would you soften my heart towards him? And then would you use me to invite him into what you're doing? I used to work in sales, and we had solutions engineers, and they always got on my nerves. And I remember I went out after work with one of them. It was so hard to talk to him because it was just like, dude, you're just so dialed in on your work, man. Just expand your horizons a little bit. And I was like, God, just help me, to, help me to see the person that you've created here that you love and that you value. If you're a solutions engineer... Ask God to help you to see the value in the salesperson. That just seems to be slimy and lying all the time. <laughs> but for each one of us in the lives that we're living, in the careers and the spaces, you go on and on and on. Think about yourself for a moment. Think about the person that God has placed in your life and go, God, do I love that person like you love them? Do I value that person like you value them? And if I don't, Lord, change and transform me. This is the devotion to prayer. Change and transform my heart, God, to love those people, to see the value in them like you see the value in them. So that's, that's people, right, in our life. The next layer of this, though, and where it starts to impact our church and our community, is things like our home bases. Right here at Base Church, if you're not, how many people are a part of a home base? Quick throw a hand up. Amazing. That's awesome. Anybody that had their hand down, that's, that's all right. We'd love for you to join a home base. Home base is, is the backbone. This is the backbone of our church. Sundays are not the backbone of our church. Gathering like this, I just explained why that's not enough in your life. But your home base and the people that are a part of your home base, this is what God has called us to. It's to these smaller communities, to love one another, to support one another, to come alongside them. Home bases are places in our church of 12 to some have 30 or 40 people that are gathering together to read their Bible, to eat together, and to... Um, sorry, I got distracted by something outside. What is the last one? Thank you, sir. <laughs> serve our community, to eat together, to read our Bible together, serve our community. Here's the temptation with home bases. Home bases can easily become an opportunity just to hang out with our friends. Home bases can easily become even a Bible study, a great Bible study with our friends. But at the heart of our home bases, and if you're, you're a home base leader, I'm, I'm speaking to you this morning. If you're an area owner, I'm speaking to you this morning. If you're part of a home base you can toss your ear this way a little bit too because you'll probably be a home base leader one day as God brings more people into this church. If at the heart of our home bases we have lost 
the love and the desire to bring in people that don't look like us, don't talk like us, don't know Jesus like us, don't act like us, into a community and a relationship where we can love them and value them and take care of them and give to their needs, we have lost the plot of our home bases. If that's not at the baseline of what we're doing, then we might not be a home base. We might be something else. It might be a Bible study. It might be a group of friends that hang out a couple times a month. In the worst case scenario, it might actually be a click. But in our church, as, as base church, home bases are on mission to reach people that are far from God, to bring them into relationship with Jesus through a demonstration of our love for them and our love for one another. That's the backbone. And to do that until we grow and we grow and we can't fit all the people in anymore, and then we send more out to continue to do this. That's the heart behind home bases. Because it's the heart of Jesus. It's not the heart behind home bases because we just want to do the hardest thing we can find. It's the heart behind our home bases because it would be so much easier for Jesus to have stayed with those 12 disciples and they all hang out together and have a great time and then they all pass away and the church doesn't continue on in advance. But that's not what Jesus left. What Jesus left was say, I love you guys so much that I'm going to invest in you and take care of you and value you and fix the things that are broken in your life and the parts of you that are, are far from me. I'm going to draw them back in and then I'm going to send you out so that more people can experience this. That's what it means. And, and, and then when we have our home base together, so it's not just about inviting people in, but as we gather together, it's about actually caring for one another. It's about actually showing up in the, in the moments where people are in great need. I mean, I can list off many times I've been on, on the receiving side of this in our home base. I remember when my dad passed away last year, we had to go out to, um, to take care of the funeral and do all this stuff. And and without even like asking or messaging, because it would be overwhelming, Micah Stairs, who's bouncing his baby in the back there, they're our home base leader. Can we give it up for Micah and Becca? They're phenomenal home base leaders. They gathered up our home base, and they all went over to our place, and they raked up all the leaves that were on our property and took care of everything that they could take care of without bothering us in, in that season. That was really challenging for myself and my family. Small thing. But they looked, and they saw, oh, man, there's a need, and there's an opportunity for us. I go on and on, on and on and about that stuff. But as home base, like people in home bases, we got to look to the, the need that actually exists. I remember uh, with somebody, uh, before home base, it was called Locals. Before Locals, it was called Connect Group. And Beth and I started, we just like to rebrand things all the time. <laughs> before base, it was Slate. Before Slate, it was Embassy. But, <laughs> but at our church, like, I remember at one of these iterations, you know, Beth and I, we started our Connect Group going with the whole intent and there are some people in the room with the original connect group that we had. The whole intent of Beth and I starting our connect group was to find all the people that didn't seem to fit in normally into like some of the groups that exist in our church and go like, hey, why don't you come and be a part of, of our, our relationships in our life? So we had for two years in our small apartment all this like grab bag of people, random mix of people that would come in and be a part of it. And sometimes the nights were super uncomfortable because it was like, Nobody has commonalities, and one person really likes to talk about their interests, and some nights they were beautiful, and as time went on, those relationships got stronger and stronger, and we had this space where we could see people that were in the lobby on a Sunday that didn't necessarily, like, have relationships. We could bring them in, and oftentimes they would find spots at other, other spots in our church, and, and I remember, um, I remember in, in one of these iterations, there was somebody that, uh, that had a need, and um, uh, they had something that was stolen, and they needed to replace it. And I remember going, oh, we got we to gotta do something about that. We actually need to, like, it has to affect us a little bit. And so we, we took some money and we um, put it out in order to take care of the thing that was stolen. And then, like, a month or two later, the same thing got stolen again. And I was like, bro, you got to lock that thing up, man. <laughs> you, got, you can't just keep buying these things, bro. We got to figure out what's going on here. But that was my heart. That was my heart posture towards it. And, and I think what God was teaching me in that moment as I look back on it and go like, bro, that's the wrong heart. I should have just gone, God, I have what I need in order to give to this person. Would you, would you give me like the, the love for them to actually give open-handedly with what you've blessed me with? And we'll, I want to talk about this, what it, what it says. Like it affected their time. All right, we talked about our time and the people that we choose to bring in our life. It affected their money. Verse 45, they sold property and possessions to give to anybody that had need. Sometimes we read this and it's like we sold all our property and all our possessions and then we put it all in one big pot and as a church we divvied it up. That's not what it's talking about here. They sold some property, some fields, some possessions. As need arose, those that had took care of those that didn't have. It affected their pocketbook. It affected their finances. 
It wasn't just something that they gave lip service to. They actually lived it out, and they said, I have something, and I have a plan for this thing. Nobody that has accumulated wealth in this life is somebody that isn't planning on using that for something. You're either using it to multiply or using it to, to um, expand a business or to do that or leverage it or whatever, but people go, I'm going to sacrifice this thing to take care of those that are in need. I'm going to take what God has given me, the wealth God has given me, and I'm going to bless those around me with it so that nobody in this community has need. Imagine if our church lived like that. Imagine if those that had gave to those that were in need. Those that God has blessed greatly. Because listen, what we have isn't ours. God has given it to us. Every day I wake up, I'm, I've got this van right now that's in a shop, and I'm going, God, oh, where am I going to get the money to replace this? And I have to remind myself, God, this is your money. So if you want me to waste it on replacing the engine in this van, bro, okay. <laughs> up to you, or you can fix it in the name of Jesus. <laughs> But man, what we have isn't ours. <laughs> it's God's. So if there's somebody that God values that he's brought into your life that's in need, ask yourself, God, am I devoted enough to this that I'm letting it affect my pocketbook, affect my plan, affect my thing? Yeah. I have a couple more examples, but I want to bring out an example that we see in Scripture here. Acts 5, um, Ananias and Sapphira. Does anybody know this story? Spooky story, man. So the Bible actually talks about this a little bit. Ananias and Sapphira, they're a couple that in Acts 5, um, they're like, hey, we're part of this too. Everyone's selling stuff. Everyone's taking care of each other. That's sick. Us too. We, we want to be a part of this thing as well. And so they go and they sell this field. And they say, yeah, we're giving it all back to the, to the church to take care of those that are in need. But they both chose, like, hey, we're going to keep a little bit for ourselves. I look at that act and I go, it's commendable. They took what they had, they sold it, kept a little bit for themselves, gave most of it back to the church to be a blessing to the people that were in need. Good job, guys. But what happens is Ananias gets brought in and, and Peter starts to question him. And he's like, hey, you sold this field. Did you give everything that you had back, back to the community? And Ananias is like, yeah, I did. And then he's like, you're lying. And God strikes him dead immediately. Wild. And then they bring Sapphira in. And they're like, hey, did you guys sell this field? And give everything that you had back to the church to, to be a blessing. And she's like, yeah, we did. Boom. God strikes her dead as well. I read that story. I'm like, God, what? They did a pretty good job. <laughs> they gave like a lot here. Why? And it wasn't, it wasn't that they weren't giving back to the community. It wasn't that they weren't taking care of those that were in need. It was that they were giving lip service to something and not doing it with their whole heart. So they were lying about it. So they're saying, hey, I really am devoted like this. And this is how devoted I am, how committed I am. But their heart lived in a different place. They wanted an outward praise. But internally, they were, they were still holding on to things for themselves. When I read that story, what I'm not saying to everybody here is like, go sell everything you have or God will strike you dead. When we read that, we go, man, we can't let this be a faith that is full of lip service as a church. We can't be the kinds of people when there's a need in our, our home base and somebody goes, hey, I'm really struggling to go, oh, man, I'll, I'll pray for you. Let me text my mom. Hey, mom, can you pray for this couple in our home base? God really needs to provide for them. God's got a way to provide. He's going to use somebody to provide for them. Bro, maybe God wants to use you to provide for the people that are in front of you that he's placed in, in your path, in your community, so you can be a blessing. We're blessed to be a blessing. We can't give lip service to following Jesus. We've got to be devoted to our faith. Why? Because Jesus didn't give lip service to us. Right? Jesus didn't go, oh man, I really love these people. Not enough to die for them. Just enough to come and take on flesh and teach them about my values. And then I'll go back into heaven. Everything's cool. I, I don't want to go through the pain of the cross. But I do want them to know that I love them. It was not the Jesus that we see. The Jesus that we see in scripture does all of this. Leaves heaven. Comes on. Takes on flesh lives out his life amongst many people that don't know who God is or that God loves them, comes as the Messiah that people have been waiting for, and then goes and takes on all the sin. We talked about this last week and why this had to happen this way. Takes on all the sin of all humankind and dies on the cross. And we know that this cost Jesus something. Sometimes we can look at that and we can go like, oh, Jesus was God. He was cool. He's all powerful. He can do whatever he wants. We know this cost Jesus something because before he dies, he's in the Garden of Gethsemane. He's praying to the Father. And he says, God, if there is any way, let this cup pass from me. If there's another way to do this, to reconcile your people that you love so much, please let this cup pass from me because I don't want to do it. 
And what does he say then? Not my will be done, but your will be done. Jesus could have left that garden, got on a donkey, and took off. <laughs> Lip service. God, not my will, your will be done. Everything I have is yours, I'll do whatever you call me to do. Not really. But what does Jesus do? He goes, and he gets captured, and he takes a beating, and he takes a lashing, and he takes a crown of thorns, and he carries a cross up on Golgotha, and he gets nailed to the cross, and he takes on the sin of the world so that we can be reconciled back in a relationship with him, so that those that are lost can be found, so that those that are swimming around going, I don't know the value of my life, I don't know the purpose of my life, can come into the reality that God loves them and has a value on their life and has a purpose for their life. You see it in the early church, man. The early church was devoted to what God is doing. It's affecting every area of their life. And people took notice. Point two. Good thing there's only two points this morning because point one was long. Point two. Point one, they were devoted. People noted. People took notice. Everyone was filled with awe at the many wonders and signs performed by the apostles. They were breaking bread in their homes and they ate together with glad and sincere hearts, praising God, enjoying the favor of all people. And the Lord added to their number daily those that were being saved. People are watching what is happening. Perfect timing, guys. I was about to invite you up. They're watching what's happening in the lives of these believers. And it's changing them and it's transforming them. And they're going, man, I want what they have. I want what's going on there. I want to be a part of it. Add me to their number. Help me to be devoted. Help me to do what you guys are doing. Help me to live out what you're living out because what you're doing matters. And I can see it's real. And I can see it changes you. This morning, before anybody gets here, we get all of our volunteers together and we pray over the morning and we, we do like a little encouragement. And this morning we were sharing about um, spaces that we were working on, on sharing our faith and telling people that Jesus loves them, inviting them to church. And David Klompfus, he works at a company called Float in Toronto. And he was saying they had a big uh, meeting, general meeting this, this past week. And he was there and they went around the circle saying, hey, why do you do what you do? Why do you work so hard? What's the why behind your work? People were saying like, oh, my parents, I want to you know, make my parents proud. He was saying one dude was just like, I want to make as much money as I can, and that's like my why. When it got to David, he was like, why do I do this? And he's like, I could easily pass on like a, you know, because I really care about this job or something like that, or I want to, you know, make my parents proud like everybody else. But David said like, I, I want to do a good job here because I realize the work in my life, I'm not doing for myself. I'm, I'm doing that as unto the Lord. The Bible says to, to work at everything that you put your hands to as unto God. So I want to make him proud and I'm doing my best. And it's not just about me. I, I want to I serve God in the things that I'm doing. He said the people at work, he's like, it was really cool because a lot of them are like actively uh, making fun of his faith. <laughs> In and, in and out, kind of in different conversations and stuff. And he says, I feel like there's a hostility towards my faith. But in that spot, when I shared about that, like I was getting nods all across the room. And, and a couple of people chimed in and said, like, yeah, you can see it. You can see that, like, there's a selflessness in what you're doing. And that's what it looks like to live this out, for people to go, why are they different than the rest of us? Why are they motivated to do that? And we don't go around boasting about the things that we do in our home bases or in our church. But man, if you live this stuff out, like the reason I'm sharing some of the stories that I have is because I'm not sharing a lot of the stories that I have. Because I'm doing my best to live this out day in and day out. Who are the people that are in need? How can I show up for them? How can, in their darkest moment, I can meet them in their, their time of need? I can provide in the ways that God has given and, and provided for me. When I take somebody aside and I'm praying for them, I'm not just praying for them. I'm going, God, how can you use me in their life to meet this need? Why do we do this? Because Jesus did it. Because in our darkest moment, where we were farthest from him, while we were yet sinners, God hung on a cross to bring us back into relationship with him. The bad news of our life is that we are more broken than we can imagine. And no amount of self-help books and therapy and all these things is going to get us out of the brokenness that lives inside of us. But the beauty of the cross, the beauty of Jesus is that no matter how broken we are, God loves you so much that he gave his life to draw you back into relationship with him. And God didn't cross heaven and earth and hang on a cross so that we could have marginally better lives. God did this so that we could live transformed lives that don't look like the world around us, that are full of what? Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, faithfulness, gentleness, gratitude towards a living God who loves us. So that as we interact with the people around us, they go, man, something is different about them. Come on to my home base. We're having dinner at, at my house this Friday. And we go to the house. We get around all these people. What's going on with these people? These are the nicest people I've ever met. So kind. I've heard this before. What's the deal with all your friends? 
hey, a bunch of guys were all getting over to this guy's house to have steaks. Why don't you come and hang out? Bro, what was the deal with all this? They were, everyone was so nice. They were asking me about my life. They were checking in on me. Like, nobody does that. So when people encounter base church, they encounter the love of Jesus. That's the heart. That's the desire. That's the goal. When people come to your home base, they encounter the love of God, whether they know God or whether they're far from God. Whether they feel like they're doing well or whether they feel like they are in the deepest pit. The church is meant to be a light post of the love of a Savior that will cross heaven and earth and die on a cross to draw that one back into relationship with him. What a beautiful message that we have. What a beautiful life we get to live out in this truth that Jesus loves us. And my challenge to us as a church this morning is to walk away from this today going, am I devoted to this? Am I committed to Jesus in my life? Not just on a Sunday morning. The reason I get up here when like, we're worshiping and I look around the room and we all got hands in our pockets and slumped shoulders like we just found out our dog died. I'm like, that's just not how we're supposed to be, bro. Like as people that understand what God has done for us, we got to get on our knees in this place. Say, God, thank you for your goodness. When we sing songs of praise to God, it's got to move our bodies. We got to lift our hands. I got to lift my voice. I got to jump out of my skin. I'm so grateful for the reality of what God has done in my life. And if we aren't people that are living transformed lives full of this stuff, anybody that walks into our church and sees us going like this, if this is the time where we're supposed to be giving praise back to God, do these people even believe this? Does it matter to them? Man, if we're not doing it here, are we doing it on Monday and Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday? Are we living devoted lives to God? And this is not just about raising your hands in worship. It's about where your time goes. It's about where your money goes. It's about your, your attention and your intent and your focus. We live in devoted lives to Jesus, devoted lives to fellowship, devoted lives to prayer, devoted lives to the teaching of the word of God. Or we're just kind of coasting in the grace that God has given us. I don't think so. When I look at our church, I'm very grateful for what God is doing. And I also never want to stop sharing this kind of message to say God has so much more in store for us we would take all these little pieces of our life and give them back to him and say, God, I'm devoted to you. I'm going to let you affect my time. I'm going to let you affect my finances. I'm going to let you affect my interests. We're in close this morning, so why don't you stand up with me? I'll pray for two groups of people as we often do here today. And so if you would just bow your heads and close your eyes this morning. If you're here today and you're going, man, I want to be a part of the family of God. I've gone a long time maybe being aware of Jesus or having a knowledge of him, but I've never actually devoted myself to Jesus, given my life to God, accepted this gift of life and salvation. The Bible says it's really easy. If you would just believe in your heart and confess with your tongue, you'll be saved. Saved from your brokenness, saved from eternity apart from God. God wants to meet you where you are today. If that's you this morning and you want to respond to this love that Jesus has for you, say, I want to accept this gift. Without anybody looking around, a private moment between you and God, just raise your hand for me real quick. Just as an outward expression, say, hey, I want to accept this gift. I want to follow Jesus today. Come on. I want to pray for you this morning. Lord, thank you for anybody that's making that decision here today. Those that have said, I want to follow Jesus. I don't just want to live this life for myself, but I want to accept this gift of life and life to the full found in Jesus in the cross. Lord, I pray that you would meet them in this moment, that you would fill them with your Holy Spirit, God, that you would open their eyes to the reality of a life with you, and you would bring people around them to walk out this faith journey. In your name we pray. Amen. Amen. It's great. Zach, you can clap, man. Come on, we can clap for those that have made that decision today. It's the best. And this morning for, for us in the room that are going, man, I'm looking at this early church and I don't have every day to gather in the temple courts like this, but I kind of lost some of that devotion, some of that commitment to God. I sort of allowed some other things in my life to become bigger than God. And I want to change that this morning. If that's you today, with every head bowed and every eye closed, why don't you just raise up a hand and say, God, 
would you re-inspire me to your goodness today? Re-inspire me to the kind of life that you want me to live, the kind of people that you want to draw into my life. Lord, I thank you for the hands that are going up across this room. My hand is up, God. Would you open our eyes to what you're doing in the world around us, God? You have positioned every person in this room for a reason and for a purpose, God. And I pray that we would not walk through the day in and day out of our lives missing what you're doing, Lord, but that we would be devoted to you, committed to you, expectant of what you're doing, God. Would you open our eyes to the love that you have for us, Lord? Would you open our eyes to the love that you have for the people around us, God? Would you change us? Would you transform us? God, would you bring an excitement to the people in this room about inviting those that look different and act different into our lives? God, would you help that not be a scary thought for us, God, but one full of anticipation, knowing what you could do in their life? Or would you change our perspective? God, would you fill us with your Holy Spirit today? Because you did not send us out of this place to do this work alone, but God, you've gifted us your presence and your spirit. So in this moment, God, I ask that your spirit would fill each person in this room, God, that we'd be inspired and renewed today. We love you. In your name we pray. Amen.